Well, hi everyone. This is Michael and welcome to the LoveWorks Dreamers and Doers podcast. We are bringing you today hot episode number 54. And we really appreciate you tuning in more than you know. We realize in the podcast universe, there are hundreds, thousands, millions of great podcast opportunities for you. So thank you for tuning into ours. And it's ours where at LoveWorks where we believe that you are never too young to be a dreamer and you are never too old to get started working on that dream. That is right. And our hope with Dreamers and Doers is that each week our special guest is going to connect with you wherever you find yourself today. And they're going to inspire you to become the best version of yourself for tomorrow. And Carolyn, today's guest is going to meet us in a very special place. I noticed just an extra twinkle in your eye is we're going to be talking about music today. Michael, I love music. I could probably talk about music all the day long. Well, you are going to get that opportunity at least the first part of the morning. Each segment of Dreamers and Doers, we love to curate different types of music, books, podcasts, blogs, organizations, and even people to follow that could really encourage your personal growth. Because we really believe at LoveWorks that personal growth can be a blast. And so, Carolyn, I'm going to let you do the honors here and help us to build this musical runway of who we should be at least potentially interested in following. Yeah. So the first band I'm going to talk about and song I'm going to talk about is Say by Moon Taxi. And they're a really cool band. Um, but this song, Say, is a new release from this year. And it's all about speaking up and doing those things that and saying those things that you're maybe afraid to say. So even if it's like in class and you're afraid to raise your hand and ask a question like I was, um, that may be a moment that you need to speak up and say something. Or maybe you need to speak up and say something for someone else. Um, I think it's a really great song. And uh, the first time I heard it, I just remember thinking this is exactly the song that I needed, especially when I was in middle school and I was so afraid to speak up and use my voice. And so even to this day, though, um, I find it, I'm, of course, I'm finding it an encouraging song and encouraging me to speak up um, when it's necessary. So well, about Carolyn, you, Michael? Well, thank you for tuning, turning me onto the song and the Hirsch household. It is definitely a Hirsch van mobile favorite with all three of my kids. One of the one of mine that I want to talk just a little bit about is a special album that is called Unstuck. And this was this musical album is really inspired by the book called Unstuck written by David Skidmore, but the album was produced by David Skidmore and Cadence. And what I really like about this album that makes it, I think, really unique is that every track on the album is dedicated and inspired by one of the chapters in the book. And Carolyn, you know that we all have different ways and styles of, of learning. And, I, and if, if yours doesn't happen to necessarily be reading a book, it could be auditory. And so an opportunity to be able to listen, to be inspired, challenged, and motivated. So that's definitely one that I would recommend. And I do have a second one to recommend. And we're going to talk about this one in a little bit. But the name of this album is called Broken Pieces. And I'll just, I'll just give this little sampling. It's Broken Beyond Repair that was released in 2015 by a special guest, that we may be having a conversation with soon. Ooh, well, that sounds uh, that sounds about right. So, <laughs> and if you're out there right now, hey, this is our roll call time. So drop a musical emoji and let us know if you have a favorite song that is getting you motivated, getting you out of bed and getting you inspired um, to do your dream. So those were a couple songs um, and an album um, that has been inspiring us. And so love to hear that. Well, Carolyn, let's get to the format, dreamers and doers. Each week, we have the opportunity to be able to sit down with a different dreamer and doer guest where they take a few moments to be able to share at least one of their dream stories. And we don't stop there. We love to be able to hear about the early beginnings and what were some of those first steps that they took to begin to reach their dream. And we hope that it's going to inspire you to get from where you are today to the place that you want to get to tomorrow. Before we jump into the interview, though, we've got a trivia question and a chance for you to win a prize. And I bet it'll be a musical prize. So if you're a big <laughs> music lover, definitely jump into this one. So today's question is, how many strings are on a violin? 
So we're just looking for a number here, looking for how many strings are on a violin. First person that gives us the correct answer, we will ship a prize directly to your house. Carolyn, I would be embarrassed this morning to tell you how many strings I thought were on a violin. <laughs> and they're way more than the answer. Like a mini guitar, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's That's meet hard. a dreamer and doer guest today. Special friend. We've known him for years. We'd love for you to meet our friend, Kyle Dillingham. Kyle Dillingham of Oklahoma City started playing the violin when he was nine. While still in high school, Dillingham was featured twice on Nashville's Grand Ole Opry and had performed with legends Roy Clark and Hank Thompson. He later then went on to receive his bachelor's degree in instrumental music performance from o uh, Oklahoma City University. D Dillingham has taken his music to 41 countries and he's earned the title Oklahoma's Musical Ambassador. And just a few of the people that he's performed for is the King of Malaysia, the Princess of Thailand, Beijing Central Conservatory, Singapore's National Day Celebration, and he's also performed for many government leaders, including the Japanese, Thai, Saudi Arabian ambassadors, as well as many U.S. ambassadors while abroad. This guy's been all around the world. He's also known as the skateboarding fiddler. So let's meet Kyle. Good morning, Carolyn. Yay, uh, good how morning. Are you? Good morning, Hello, Kyle. How are you, Kyle? So did we have a winner yet for the for the uh, the number of strings on the violin? We do. We've got a student. It looks like Colin Colin Collinator is his name. Okay. okay. Out there on YouTube. <laughs> well, uh, because I, I I never can resist uh, you know the difference between the uh, the violin and a fiddle. And uh, it's kind of a joke of one of the jokes I like to tell. And because uh, a lot of people hear about a fiddle and a violin, but they don't realize that, you know, what, what are the differences? And so the joke I like to make is that the difference between a violin and a fiddle is that a violin, as we all know now, has four strings. But a fiddle has four strings. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael, you don't have to feel embarrassed about, about the strings or the strings in the future now. So. Okay, just because I thought there were 12 on the violin, uh, no. <laughs> it feels like it, I'll tell you that sometimes. Well, Kyle, we were having a little fun before we went live talking about the last time that we saw you, and it was actually at our LoveWorks building. You were here for a special event, and I love how you set this up. You said, Michael, some people like to make a grand entrance, but I like to make a grand exit. And then without exaggeration, you were playing the fiddle, you were on a skateboard, you somehow jumped off of our, of, or rolled off of our stage, down our 25 yard narrow hallway and out the front doors of our campus, beelined it for your car and you went home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's not that I didn't enjoy my, enjoy my time and was in a rush to get out, but it was, it was sure fun. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of emphasis um, on the first impression we make, but but uh, I bet nobody remembers what happened when I showed up, but everybody remembers when I exited. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we, we, can't, we can't always just leave it at that first impression. We have to think, think about uh, the impression in general that we're creating anywhere we go. And sometimes that last impression can be one of the most important for us. Already a quick early takeaway with the two of you, Kyle. I'm liking where this is going. <laughs> sure. All the, all the performers out there, all the leaders out there, hopefully you guys are now thinking about your grand exit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love that. And well, I love what you, you know, just like, what do you, what's the lasting impression? What's the last thing people are thinking about when you leave? I think that's actually really cool. Right. But let's get started and jump into the interview. And um, Kyle, we'd love to start with this question because we are the Dreamers and Doers podcast. And we like to ask our dreamer and doer, which one do they consider themselves a little bit more naturally? You know, we know that you're a big dreamer and you've also done it, um, but what comes more easily to you? Uh, Carolyn, I'd say definitely that the dreaming part comes more naturally for me. Um, as much as I have accomplished and done in my life, I, I could probably sit and talk the rest of the day about the things that I dreamed about doing that didn't get done. Um, and I think that's okay. I think we have to, uh, 
you know, be graceful with ourselves um, and, and just realize that we're all, you know, we have to, most importantly, we have to always do our best. I like to say, um, one of the things that I like, that I actually like to say is that um, I'm always doing my best to do my part and, um, and realize that we're not, whatever we're doing, we're also not the only person doing it. Even if it's a solo project, there's probably other people involved. And one of the things that, um, that I found that's, that's been helpful in getting me across that threshold of dreaming and doing is uh, being sure that you have a team in place um, that, that kind of somebody, at least somebody to keep you accountable. Um, I've got my wife who's, you know, uh, just what well, was just last night was asking me about some, some idea that I had talked about a month ago and said, where are you on that? You know, I had Michael uh, just this morning asking me, uh, there had been a, a bit of Facebook chatter uh, uh, in an old video from, from one of the times I had been there at Love Works with Cadence. And we were in a chat kind of talking about, we should, man, we should, you know, make an album or do a, a single or something together. And um, it's just one of those things that it's so easy to talk about, but Michael was asking me this morning, so do you guys have a date yet you guys got that that song written or recorded or you know when are we gonna when are we gonna be talking about it on the dreamer and doers podcast you know <laughs> song recommendations um so uh but definitely the 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 dreaming i i um i think that uh i i do believe that that god gives us um this his holy spirit it's this inspiration that is that is within us i mean talking about the creator of the universe, there's this infinite source um, and it's, and it's in and accessible to all of us. And so I think we all have this potential and, and capability of dreaming. It's whether or not we decide to engage with it. Um, and maybe there's those that, that obviously that the doing is so much more natural and maybe they're not as tapped into some of those creative forces that I know are in each and every one of us. Mm. Well, Kyle, I, I hope you only feel encouraged by my question about the album. Oh, Som yeah. Sometimes I like to sometimes I like to joke, you know, when someone starts in like in a dating relationship, the question that they eventually get is, when are you going to get married? Married. And then you get married. And then eventually the next question is, when are when you, are you going start? to have children? <laughs> Your family. And then start having children and you have your first child. And sometimes you get asked, well, are you going to continue your family, have a second one after your second kid? You'll never get another question about another kid after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, even, even the strangers have pity, uh, start pitying you. <laughs> it's very true. No, but I love, I love what you said earlier, though. You, you, you mentioned you think you're, you feel that you are a natural dreamer. But I like what you said, though, about being graceful with yourself and not being too hard on yourself, especially when all of us feel like we're leaving some things that are left undone. But I like your encouragement though about putting forth your best effort. So if you don't mind, take us back to early childhood. And I am very eager and excited this morning to learn about what Kyle Dillingham was like, the early dreamer. So talk with us a little bit about that. Uh, when I was when I was a kid, and I would say even um, boy, probably even like uh, middle school age, I still remember that my dreams were to uh, become a farmer, a wheat and cattle farmer, just like my grandfather. And I wanted a, I even wanted a 1979 uh, ba uh, baby blue pickup, just like my grandpa. And I wanted it beat up and and dirty and you know and hundreds of thousands of miles on it. I didn't want a brand new one, you know. And I, and I, but then I also had, it's funny because I was doing music, um, but at that particular point, I, I was, uh, being a professional musician, so to speak, was not one of my dreams. Uh, however, I did have a, a big dream of being a professional skateboarder. And if I wasn't going to be a farmer, I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. Even when I was out on the farm driving the tractor round and round, I was counting my hours and... It's funny, I'd keep my hours in the dust in the tractor. I would, I would, you know, make these little hash hashes for my hours in the dust. Um, 
And the end, and every time I'd, I'd get bored going round and round, I'd start counting the dollars and I'd think how much closer I'd get to that new skateboard or those new wheels or bearings or whatever it was that I was obsessing over. Um, but I was so, um, so focused on this dream of being a professional skateboarder that uh, my best friend and I, it was actually in fifth grade, my best friend and I, we made a, a pact, a vow with one another that that we were not going to um, ever touch alcohol or sm smoke or drugs or anything like that because we didn't, not because for our health or for the sake of, you know, falling off the deep end or any horrible things that can be result from those, from those things, from those, some of those habits or, or substances. And I, but it was because we didn't want anything to uh, impede us from, from succeeding in our dreams of becoming professional skateboarders. Skateboarding kept me on the straight and narrow <laughs> through all the way through, you know, through all those vulnerable years when it might've been uh, tempting to, to uh, you know, to not keep so, such a straight and narrow path. And, and, and it's interesting to think about how a dream like that, although it, it didn't actually um, necessarily come to fruition, although I'll get, I'll get back to that in just a moment, uh, it played a purpose in my life. The dream itself, um, played an important role in my life. I think about the hours of dedication and focus that I put in. I remember um, in the summers, my friend Dustin and I, we would wake up, we'd wake up at like 6 a.m. and get our boards and like head out for the day to go skate. And we'd be out all day. And I don't even know how we did that. And we would find, you know, we would skate downtown. We'd find some place to get food. And we would be, we'd be gone all day. And then we'd come back home and we would uh, be there in time to have dinner at like his house or my house. And then we would go back out and we'd be outside and we would just start practicing tricks. We might just be out on the front on the sidewalk over and over, over and over, like 500 times until we got a trick landed, um, working on that same trick, you know, for hours and hours. And then at night we would get back in and we had to come inside. We would like watch skate videos. And while we were watching skate videos, we'd take our skateboards apart down to each bearing out of the wheel to investigate and make sure they were clean and there's no dust. And we knew every wheel and every inch of our board intimately. And we would rotate and, and we wanted to, to, to know the ins and outs of our board so that we would be more connected to it and have every possibility to succeed in this dream. And what I found later in life, um, Let's fast forward to when I went to college and entered music school on the violin. Um, I can't imagine anything, uh, any p educational path that could require more uh, self-motivation and discipline than, uh, than being a music student and, and studying and, and trying to master an instrument. And But I have to point back to things like like the skateboarding, that dream of, of skate, being a professional skateboarder that prepped me and seasoned me um, to have the kind of focus and dedication that it took to be that music student that was going to, you know, say every day, um, you know, I'm going to block off nine to midnight, at least where I at least have three hours a day to practice the violin. And that doesn't include, you know, there would be days where I would be coming from a three hour opera musical theater rehearsal. And before that I had an hour orchestra rehearsal. And then I had my uh, rehearsal with my string quartet. And then I had my violin lesson. And then I was, I had other time where I was trying to prep for, for, for those classes, you know, and the music that I needed to learn. And so um, it's, it's, we, we also have to think, I think, about the dreams that we have and how they might even be stepping stones into our future dreams. Kyle, if you don't mind, can, if you could just please connect one dot for me. And I can't be the only one that's wondering. So I kind of get the, the music dream, the farming dream, but what was the origin of the skateboarding dream? Do you remember? You know, my brother... Uh, I have an, an older brother, four years older, and um, 
he got a skateboard uh, and I don't, I don't, can't really say why or how, other than it was just becoming really popular mm-hmm. um, in the, the middle eighties. And, um, and so he had a skateboard and, and that, so naturally I think as a little brother, um, I was, I was wanting that too. Yeah. And so uh, it wasn't really much more than that. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I think that once I had my initial footing on the board and you felt that, that, that feeling of flight, you're, you know, that pro- self-propelling adrenaline thing or launching off a, a launch ramp um, or, or dropping into a half pipe, those kind of things just were exhilarating and thrilling on a level that, uh, like nothing else could be achieved in the front yard, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, so I think, I think that was, that was really it. Uh, I don't know how it became so obsessive for me. Um, but I, it, other than also, it's a, an interesting community. The skateboarding community is very, um, it's one that's very welcoming and very encouraging. Mm-hmm. And you could be, uh, you could show up to a skate park and there might be a pro skater and, and people of all different levels and ages. And you are maybe, you know, the very beginner and you're like struggling to do like an, a basic ollie, just, you know, a little jump in the air on your board, um, one inch off the ground and, and you do it and everybody's applauding you, you know, and encouraging, you know, keep going, do it again, you know, and, uh, I think that was the, you know, I think that was feeding and nourishing for, for me as well. And, uh, we all need that encouragement, uh, for, even for the little things that we're, we're doing and gosh, uh, you know, I've taken, I took some of that along with me and even in the process of raising children, thinking about, you know, not take for granted how, everybody is at different levels and the things they're learning and the things they're doing. And maybe we can all uh, have a lesson from that, that we need to think about how we can be more encouraging to others in their dreams. Um, And that might be the thing that, that uh, helps them transition from dreaming to doing as well. So let's get some more skateboarding culture out into the world. I'm, I'm behind it. (laughs) <laughs> I'm behind it 100. percent you know what the Bible says about it, Carolyn, don't you? About skateboarding? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's for it. It's for okay, awesome. <laughs> Sweet. Well, I love that. Well, Kyle, I feel like we we got a little preview, of course, into your childhood, but also your work ethic, you know, like especially when there's passion behind it and just trying again. And I have to imagine um falling again and again and again as well, um, in the process of skateboarding. But you know, you started violin when you were nine and you're a world-class violinist now and i have to think that your work like your worth ethic has to be a part of that um and so you know like tell us more like what do you feel like has kind of set you apart over the years like is it the hard work like let us know i'll I'll tell you what um i've never ever forget when i was um a junior in high school is when i had my first opportunity to be on the grand Ole opry in nashville tennessee and this is the this is a stage, an iconic stage. This is the, the the venue that made country music famous, and there I was, you know, a seventeen year old kid, and um, I was being featured that night with a banjo player comedian, Mike Snyder. He's an Opry star, and when he introduced me that night at the Opry, he said, "Here's a young man that loves playing the fiddle more than anybody I've ever seen," and. And I'll tell you, at this particular juncture, um, all of that was very much true. I loved playing, and everybody could see how much I loved playing the fiddle. Um, at this very same moment, I was, you know, I had done violin audition uh, for scholarships at Oklahoma City University, where I wanted to go to school. But I, I hadn't merited scholarships to play in the orchestra at the university because of my violin playing. Um, I was the last person that somebody would have wanted in their orchestra. I was a pretty terrible violinist, um, but I had a lot of 
a lot of enthusiasm for the for the fiddling that I was doing. And I, I would say that um, sometimes, and not in every every instance, but sometimes the um, the excitement, enthusiasm that we show for the thing that we are doing can almost be as important, if not more important than than that thing that we are even doing. Because at the end of the day, especially in a field like like um, like the one I'm in, the music industry, and, and being an entertainer, um, there the the violin, the guitar, the the song, whatever these things are, these are just tools. Um, these aren't the gifts. Uh, these aren't the goals. Uh, you know, mastering the violin is was is is not the the goal of my field. Um, being as good as I can be is a personal goal because God calls us to greatness. He calls us to to do to do whatever it is we are doing as though we were doing it for him, for the Lord. So we 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 know that that we should we should do our best and try to become the best we can, but that's even that is not the goal um, or the mission, I should say, rather, of, of my industry and, and my personal career. Um, at the end of the day, all these tools are used to connect with people, make a, con a connection and an impression and a, a vulnerability, I would might even add. Uh, sometimes, you know, like even a little trick like riding out on stage with a skateboard with a violin, um, you know, it's just a, a little thing. Um, it almost, I would, it, it, nearly a shtick, I guess I would call it, but the thing that's important about it is that it catches people off guard. Um, although I was muted as I entered, that was quite a, quite a start, but I had my violin and I wanted to start with a little bit of violin because uh, nobody expects a podcast introduction to start with a little fiddle tune. Um, and I think that anything we can do in our interaction with other human beings that will catch them off guard can create a vulnerability. Um, and when you're, I, I believe that music has this innate ability, if it is so our intention, um, to, to change people's lives, to reach people. And I don't think it's, and I say that because of our intention, I don't think it's just the music. I think there's something exceptionally um, powerful about music as a tool to reach people. But I think it's, I think it's only because the Lord inhabits our praises. Mm -hmm. And for me, performing has always been first and foremost um, uh, worship. Um, it doesn't matter whether I'm playing the devil went down to Georgia or amazing grace. Um, I think, I think about it in that way. And I always have a, a prayer that, that God will use my music in a way that is way beyond my own abilities um, to reach every person on a, in a personal way and meet every person right where they are. Because um, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, every single person is, is dealing with something in their lives. There's a, there's a level of brokenness. We're in a broken world. Um, I have the project with the broken violins, um, this metaphor of our own brokenness. And we don't ever know, but I do know that if I put on a concert and there's 500 people that came, every one of those people gave up an evening of their life. And so I'd hope that I would take that serious enough um, to realize that they they could have been anywhere else in the world, but they chose to come and be there that night. So I have to think that there was something they're needing from that night. Um, that is uh, that is a responsibility of mine to take seriously. That that I should do my best to do my part and make the music the best I can, and with the hopes that it will reach. And that God can can uh, minister to each one of those people in a in a unique and special way. Wow. Kyle, I I I feel like I hope we could all kind of take that and know that we can do that in our own special way with the skills and the talents that we have, and just taking a moment to say that to our students, like you have something that you can do to the very best of your ability that is going to impact and change those around you. 
So I love that you're using your story to do that and just the intentionality behind it, that it's not just you're going out and performing, but you're, I mean, you're connecting. I think that's really amazing. Yeah, it's not, it's not a music only uh, concept. It's, it, this, this works in every field because at the end of the day, no matter what it is we're doing, ultimately it has to do with connecting with other people, even if it's selling paper clips, you know. So. <laughs> well, well, Kyle, you mentioned a project, The Broken Violin, and I'd like for us to go there next. I was reminiscing even just with myself prior to this interview, and I was thinking about my first few encounters with you. My first one, I didn't get a chance to speak with you directly, but you were performing in front of hundreds of people and I was just drawn to your passion. And I asked around and I just had to know who is that guy? And when I find out somehow we need to get him connected with LoveWorks because I would love for our students to connect his passion. Secondly, I just began hearing your name it was, and it was just about your reputation, your credibility what others were saying about you. And then I had a serendipitous opportunity to meet you at a local restaurant in Oklahoma City. And you began to share with me about a project, the Broken Violin Project. And I've not, I, I've thought about that, this story just often. And even in just the, the ministry and outreach opportunities that we have with our organization. So would you mind uh, telling our viewers and our listeners just about that project? I don't mind at all. Uh, basically, Michael, what happened is, as I uh, came upon a big box of broken violins like this one here at a local violin shop, and uh, God had just kind of put, impressed upon my heart the, the relationship between these broken instruments and us as broken individuals. I had just returned home from a uh, mission trip to Togo, West Africa, where I was at a, an orphanage, and I started seeing... Uh, suddenly seeing these broken violins, I started seeing the faces of those, of those orphan children and these instruments. And I just picked one up and I, I realized how easy it is for us to, to, to go walk past the brokenness, um, whether it's homelessness or addiction or whatever it may be, or just somebody that's, that's, um, that's dealing with grief or loss. And maybe we are, uh, are either overwhelmed, which I think is a lot of times the case when you have the big, big issues um, at the cost, even just the costs or what kind of programming and what would it look like to fix a problem like homelessness and even in our own city, forget the world. Yeah. Um, or maybe we've just become a little bit numb to it. And so it's easy just to walk by and not even see it anymore. Um, but at that day, for whatever reason, I saw these violins, and instead of being overwhelmed, God said, don't worry about that whole box of broken instruments. Just pick one up and play on that one violin. And when I did, I, I picked it up, and I started playing, and I started hearing sounds that I'd never heard before in my life. And, and I thought, wow, I've been playing the violin my whole life, and I've never heard these sounds. And it got me listening closer, and I, I spent years um, – getting to know each one of these instruments, not as a broken violin, but as a unique uh, instrument, uh, almost like a, a folk instrument from some other planet, you know, because every one of them was different. And I had to, some violin technique transferred to them, but other violin technique didn't. So it required new, new knowledge and new techniques and getting to know each instrument on a personal level. And, um, and through that whole process, uh, really also realizing that that's how we have to approach each person. I can't, um, just because I know you, Michael, doesn't mean that, that I'm going to automatically know the next person that I meet on the street. Um, everybody's going to be different the way we approach them, and the, the, uh, it's going to have to be relationship-based. It's going to have to be first, who is this person? Um, how can I connect with this person? Um, what is unique about this person? And then we should go further and say, what's, uh, what's beautiful um, about this person? And how can we bring that out? And that's what I, I realized my work with these violins was. And I'll just play just a, a hair for you because um, I played a little on regular violin, but you'll hear. So there's a diff there's definitely a different sound 
and um, and it's and it's it's unexpected. And I think if we pay it close enough attention, we'll find that with everybody we meet as well. Kyle, it's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor um, in the way that we should approach. I love each person and that we all do come with stories and we all come with, you know, histories, but, and that even allows us to kind of navigate life differently. And I, I beautiful, beautiful metaphor um, in approaching people. Well, you know, there could be more to say about this, but 2020 was a really interesting year. <laughs> and uh, We've been reflecting on that. And, you know, you've been impacted, of course, as as a musician and being a part of that industry that has been impacted so much. But um, it was also the year that you got Ambassador of Goodwill um, by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. And so we wanted to ask you, you know, what does it mean for you to be an ambassador? I feel like you've shared a lot there um, in using music and connecting with people, but um, with this new accolade and this new idea, and especially I, I would say even kind of approaching a new season of life, like what does it mean for you to be an ambassador? Well, um, I'll, I'll say this. It's um, the, the, that award came at, at such a, it could not have come at a more important time in my life, a time where I was really uh, feeling very, very low. Um, I, I remember it was like a Tuesday afternoon and I was walking around Target to see if they happened to have butter in stock. And, um, you know, and I was like, you know, I was on week, uh, on like month three or four with no performance um because every every single performance was was completely just it was just systematically removed from the calendar including like a big tour of taiwan a big uh sort of a a rolling uh set of tours in thailand that was supposed to have been uh been happening all all last year as well as a a big tour of china that was also to obviously didn't happen um and so there were a lot of disappointments uh in the side of my career um, and the things that I do, uh, the, it, it, especially the things I would do to merit such an award. Um, I, at this point in my life, I've had a chance to represent Oklahoma and the United States in 41 countries with my music. And, um, and here's what is such a special thing about, about being named Ambassador of Goodwill by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame is that um, it was not the goal. Uh, I didn't, I didn't even know that that accolade, it really existed until recently. Um, but I, from a very young age, when I started having international experiences, um, it was one of these things that I realized that I had an opportunity that was beyond just already an incredible chance to see the world or experience a new country or culture, but that everywhere I went, I wasn't just representing, uh, you know, I wasn't just representing Kyle Dillingham, but I was representing uh, the United States. I was representing Oklahoma. I was representing my friends and family. Um, I was representing uh, our Lord uh, as an ambassador for Christ everywhere I went, sharing his God's love with everybody I met. And I, and with every opportunity I had, um, there was a, a heightened awareness of the responsibilities that we have, no matter where we go, even if it's across town to the grocery store, that when we, when we are somewhere and we're being seen and interacting with other people, that we're always representing more than ourselves. Um, and I think it's, it's um, a lesson that we can't, can't uh, meditate on it enough uh, in terms of how it affects the integrity of our work, how it affects um, the way we treat people, how it affects um, just everything that we do. Because um, maybe we don't, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe um, sometimes the behaviors and the, the hideous things that people do, uh, maybe it's because they think so lowly of themselves. Um, and I think sometimes the hardest person to, to really love um, or to see the best in is maybe sometimes ourselves, as frank as that might be. Um, but if we can maybe think that we are representing more than ourselves, um, it's 
<clears throat> it's in our nature to, to, to have compassion maybe for somebody else um, or to care about somebody else. It can come so naturally for us. <clears throat> These are characteristics of God um, that, are, that are in us and in our DNA. And so maybe there is, there's this um, chance to, to really better, even better our own lives with, with those thoughts. So being an ambassador for me is, is just that. It's, um, it's the awareness and that we're, that rep, we're always representing more than ourselves. And I, I can't be more proud to, to be so for Oklahoma because um, early on in my career, uh, and I'd say all the way through high school and even beyond, I remember any time I was playing my violin in public, somebody after a performance would come up and say, oh my goodness, with a talent like yours, what in the world are you doing in Oklahoma? You should be in fill in the blank, Nashville, New York, Austin, LA, anywhere but <clears throat> God forsaken Oklahoma, you know, <laughs> grapes of wrath. Um, and and I, and it, it just broke my heart uh, every single time. And I know that people, I, I had to, to, to come to the grips that people meant it in the best way you know they were that was a positive encouraging thing they thought that they were telling me but it would break my heart because this is my home and this is a place i love and and it, it inspires me and it it shapes me as an artist and and um and so i, I kept dreaming and waiting for the day when somebody would hear me play and say man with a talent like yours it's no wonder you're from oklahoma and uh, so I, I kept I kept on a steady course of of resisting uh, the opportunities. Even as a senior in high school, I had full time performing opportunities in Nash in Nashville in the music industry. Um, I I had chances to move to New York um, and work in broad playing uh, violin in in Broadway productions. Um, every now and then, I'd I would I would have this. Uh, musical director of, who was like doing all these big Broadway tours, just call me to see if I had by chance moved to New York yet, you know, and it was tempting. And there was times where I, where I just thought, you know, this is just ridiculous. I just, just need to go where there's the opportunities. But, but I thought, you know, there's, there, this is an opportunity. I'm, I'm representing my state and I, I want to see this industry grow in my state. And I might not have millions of dollars to invest in, in a development project or new real estate development or something, but I have per potentially millions of dollars worth of talent that I can, that I can, um, that I can invest into the infrastructure of my state. And so it's with great pride that I, that I, that that honor came and it came on a day where I was so low, like I say, there I was at target and I got this phone call and I just, I just, I wandered, I was wandering around. I don't, I was just up and down the aisles of Target talking with the chairman of the board of the, and the president of Oklahoma Hall of Fame. And they were like, so we just want to know if you're, if, if you're willing to accept. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm like, well, yeah. And, and it really doesn't even matter what day it is because I don't have anything on my calendar. And you um, found the butter right then too. And it was a miracle. <laughs> it, was like... <laughs> but it, it was like, and then it right away it was like okay well it's a secret so you can't tell anybody <laughs> so like i had the best the best news of 2020 um came to me like in early may and i couldn't tell any talk about it until uh until october <laughs> so but it was it was it was encouraging for me and um we all need need a little encouragement sometimes that's for sure. Kyle, um, I mean, thank you for sh just sharing that story and thank you for loving Oklahoma. Like, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> it's, been, it's been something that I've been wanting to encourage to our students is that you can pursue your dreams even right here in Oklahoma. And sometimes you'll be called to go elsewhere, but not to feel disappointed if you're really meant to stay. Um, yeah. That you can do amazing things here. And it's, I mean, your evidence to show that. So, um, Love to ask you now, um, you know, we've seen a lot of passion. We've seen a lot of joy from you um, during this, this conversation from talking about music to broken violins to even skateboarding. But what is it that you just love about what you get to do? I 
<clears throat> I love, and I've, I've had people ask me before, don't you get tired of playing the Orange Blossom special? Don't you get tired of playing The Devil Went Down to Georgia? Or whatever yeah. it is. Or aren't you burned out of, of doing this or whatnot? And I say, I love the Orange Blossom special and The Devil Went Down to Georgia today more than I ever have in my life. I, th I think to myself, how amazing is it that I have something that I can do that I know that there has obviously been hours and hours of work that have gone into doing it, but I don't have hours and hours of work right now to be able to pick up my violin and play The Devil Went Down to Georgia. I mean, I can just do it and it's not that hard. <laughs> um, and I thought, how amazing that I have something that I can do that is easy for me and doesn't require any any resources other than just energy um which when you give you receive um that can every single time not not just some of the time but every single time change somebody's day um and bring a smile to somebody's face and make everybody happy i'm like if you had something that you could do carolyn that you that that you knew guaranteed every time you did it in you know in close proximity to people that it just made them happy wouldn't that be a motivator like <laughs> oh yeah a half? Um, i'm gonna start so, practicing my mariah carey tones again i'm just kidding you know. <laughs> so, so i um i i'm not i'm never lacking uh, inspiration uh to do what i do and i i cannot be more grateful. I showed up uh, uh, the other night. I, I showed up at somebody's house. Um, a mother had hired me to 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 show up uh, and be a surprise guest um, and do music at a 50th birthday party um, for this woman. And and I was standing as I was standing outside, um, and everything was kind of being orchestrated. They had me waiting outside the. The, the gate door that would go up along the side of the house and I would round the corner with my violin and there would be this, this woman um, sitting on the porch with, with, you know, 20 or 30 of her closest friends in life. And I would bust in like I own the place and, <laughs> and just take charge of that back porch with my violin playing and singing as if, as if I were the, the most important thing in the world. <laughs> you know, for, to all these people. Um, and to just t walk in that role, because that's what I've been asked to do. Mm -hmm. And, and sure enough, you come around the corner with the violin and, you know, playing those first notes. And, and instantly, Everybody on that porch is clued in and everybody's smiling. And the person I'm there for is just, just can hardly contain themselves. And, and it just went on like that, you know, for the next, you know, three hours. And I thought, oh my gosh, how lucky am I that this is, this is my job. This is what I do. I get to go out and make people happy. <laughs> if I, if, if, you know, God willing. Um, but I, it's, it's, um, once again, I, it comes back to this, to, uh, this, these intentions and everything we do, we, we have to align our intentions with, uh, with the work that we're doing and realizing that, that everything we do has a potential, um, to reach and, and, uh, and reach people. Um, and because if we, if, because at the end of the day, that's, that's why we're there. Um, and it's, it's not, I'm going to show up so that, um, because I could do this, I could show up at that back porch and, um, ready to, uh, let these people just be wowed. And I, and I can't wait to tell them about all the thousands of hours that went into this practice and see how amazing this is. Look how amazing this, this piece is. Wait, I'm going to play you another piece. Watch how amazing this is. You won't imagine how hard I worked trying to learn this. Nobody cares 
how hard you worked <laughs> trying to learn. Just play the piece of music, you know, play it, play it again. You know, we loved it so much the first time. Do it again, but stop talking about how, you know, nobody cares. That that's something that we we just had to do. We all have to work hard. Yeah. Uh, that's that's just been the 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 curse of the human race since since the original sin that we're gonna have to work hard. So congratulations, you have to work hard. You're gonna have to work hard no matter what you do. Um, so so leave that at the door because there's more important things and it's what we can do with what we've worked hard. Mm, that's to great. Accomplish. That's, that's great, Kyle. Yeah. Carolyn, I was just thinking in future interviews, I think I'm going to intermittently just pick up my violin and start playing for people. How, how, how does that sound? <laughs> I think people um, are going to be crying whether you, uh, one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> we may have the least watched and listened to podcasts uh, in the world, but uh, I love how you can, you can just so casually do that, Kyle. Kyle, as we're bringing our interview to a close, and we are going to offer an opportunity for questions and answers I want to ask you a question about personal growth and habits. You heard earlier that in each of our dreamers and doers segments, we always just like to curate something, whether it's a book recommendation or a music recommendation like we did today. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious at the, and I know you wouldn't in your humble way, call yourself elite, but you are definitely an elite in an elite category. What is one tip or trick or something that you continue to do today just to sharpen your toolbox and to make yourself better? Uh, well, I will tell you this, that every time I, uh, every time I rec record, I love recording um, for several reasons. It, one, you're, you're documenting and it's fun to record something and then share it with somebody just like it would be to, to perform live. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, instant gratification that look what I made, you know, <laughs> but, um, but there's also, uh, every single time I'm recording and especially with the, with the violin, um, well, violin, singing, guitar, it really doesn't matter. There's nothing that, that will Im improve me quickly like recording. Um, and so, when I, when I record, I take those opportunities. It's like, uh, you know, it's like time in the practice room, so to speak, when, you know, the old, the olden days, which was the, the old fashioned way of improving was, you know, going and, you know, playing uh, four finger note patterns at, you know, 40 uh, beats per minute. Duh. I used to do these exercises for hours and I would just be like, But like, I mean, slower, I was going up twice as fast as I would go just to kind of show the point, but it was really, really tedious, uh, disciplined kind of practice to, to train those fingers uh, and the, to get the muscle memory. It's like people say, how do you play fast? Mm -hmm. People always want to know, how do you play fat so fast? And it's lots, hours and hours of practicing slowly mm -hmm. um, that, that trains the, the muscles where to go, the muscles are going to be able to far exceed our, you know, conscious, um, you know, motor skills. Mm -hmm. So, um, but nowadays it's, it's, uh, it's recording. Mm. That's the kind of the quick answer. <laughs> or if I have a, a new piece that I need to learn. Um, but yeah, but recording is, is the sure way for me to, to sharpen, um, any of any of the tools in my tool bag. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for sharing that, Kyle. Kyle, this has been awesome. We're not quite done yet. Okay. We're going to give you a quick fiddle violin break. Carol and I are going to recap, if at all possible, our one or two favorite parts of the conversation. And then I know that there's going to be a couple of questions waiting for you. So we'll see you in just Great. a couple minutes. Beautiful. Thanks. Carolyn, I feel like Kyle Dillingham is a modern day Eric Liddell in Chariots of Fire. <laughs> what if I don't know the reference? <laughs> We're just going to have to go Google, okay? 
Sounds good. <laughs> oh, okay. Great compliment. <laughs> So I know we have questions coming in. Do you want to attempt to narrow down your top favorite part of the interview? Darn, this is gonna this legitimately is gonna be a hard one, but um, I'll talk about for sure just the idea of the broken violins. I think I I I absolutely love this idea that you know we in our like like ourselves like we are a broken instrument, um, but that doesn't necessarily you know take away our function. It doesn't take away our ability to do anything. It may mean we things a little bit differently and in our own fashion, but I love, I just love that idea and that we can also approach people differently as well because of those stories, because um, we are all just a little bit different. Mm, I like that a lot. I'm going to have to rewind to the very beginning of the interview. Surprise, surprise, you know, but we call our podcast dreamers and doers and something just really resonated with me when Kyle just talked about the aspect of a dream and we all have dreams, but at the end of the day, there's just things that we left that are undone. And I love the, the encouragement that he gave is just to be graceful on yourself and that it's okay. As long as though little caveat, you work as hard as you can and you give the best that you can. And I just love the spirit of that that at the end of the day, that something might be left that's undone, but you can go to bed at peace, just knowing that you've done the best that you could on that particular given day. And if we have the fortunate opportunity to wake up the next day, that it's just another opportunity to be able to continue to give our best and to be able to work towards work towards our dreams. I'll, I said one, secondly, I loved, in, I loved in the very beginning about the value, and Kyle was talking about, with his friend, like the value that they placed on the dream, on skateboarding and on music compared to the other lifestyle choices that they could have made. And so almost from you know sunrise to sundown, they were focused on pursuing the dream, which I'm sure you know didn't lead them to live a perfect life, but I think it probably kept them out of a lot of trouble that they potentially could have got into. I know. I'm like, that is really cool for a fifth grader to to make that conscious decision and to say, like, I'm committing to this and for them to pursue their dreams, I think is that's that's awesome. We could all no, do that a little. <laughs> no, I love it. It makes me think of the quote. If you want to if you want to live like, you know, no one else lives and you got to do the things that no one else does. And I really believe that Kyle not only did that when he was just growing up, but something that he continues to do. Uh, today. So anyway, fantastic stuff. Lots, lots more that I know that we can unpack. We don't have time for that, but we do have time for a couple of questions. So let's bring Kyle back. Yay. Hey, Kyle. <laughs> All right. We, we got you unmuted and ready. So are you ready for the first question? I'll bring it on. All right. This is going to be a fun one. And this is an audio question through our website, loveworksleadership.org and young Amberly through our special feature is going to ask you this question. Great. Hi, my name is Amberly, and I'm eight years old. I just started learning how to play the piano. My my dream is to write my own song and even maybe learn how to skateboard like Kyle. <laughs> Have you ever had stage fright? If so, how did you overcome it? Wow. It's Amberly. Is that who we had that asked the question? Amberly, what, a, right. what a thrill to hear your, your voice and in these uh, just your aspirations as a songwriter and, and the future skater of the world. Um, I'll tell you this, you can write a song on the piano and I know that you will. You're going to write lot, not just one song, you're going to write a lot of songs, um, but it's going to start with your first song. And um and just as a bit of encouragement, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't, your first song doesn't have to, you know, be a, a Grammy award winning hit mm -hmm. song. Uh, it can be simple, but just remember that in a song, um, it's, the important thing is that it's, you have a message in a song. So I just want you to encourage you to think about what it is that you want to, to say and, and then go to the piano and, and say it. Um, 
And maybe you need to write it down and keep it simple at first. Maybe you just have have one small idea and you, that you could write write one line or maybe two lines and there's a rhyme or maybe it doesn't rhyme. Um, and then go and and start very simply harmonically on the piano. Maybe you know a, one chord. Um, you got a C major chord. You could start right there and and then s sing that line and see what happens and just let let the music lead and guide you in that. And as for the skateboarding, um, go get go get a board, girl, and just uh, <laughs> knock yourself out. I'm sure, but I will say this: uh, you should set your your aspir your your aspirations much higher than skateboarding, like me. I think you you can you can be much better of a skateboarder than I ever dreamed of being. Um, if you set your set your mind to it. it, skateboarding is, I will say this is an unbelievable um, workout as well. It's like this, the core workout of, of, of your dreams. Um, and it's so much fun. So even still today, um, I love to go, instead of going to a classic gym, I like going to a skate park with my board and, and just hitting the park for, for 45 minutes to an hour. So it's, it's something that I think you'll enjoy and it's great, great exercise too. Um, sta the stage fright part, I, I mentioned uh, something early on in our conversation about, um, about our audience, my audience. When I, uh, and I've often encouraged young musicians um, in this way about the, straight, the stage fright, because yes, I have, I have for sure had stage fright. I've been more scared walking onto stages than you can ever imagine. Um, but I'll tell you the thing that can diffuse the fear quicker than anything is um, fears always come from an unknown, from having something that is unknown. And I think that the, the biggest cause of stage fright is that we don't know who is in the audience and we don't know how critical they're going to be of what we are going to do because there's no way to know. There's no way to determine that. And oftentimes where I was most nervous was walking in for my um, auditions or juries or for out on stage for my recital and my teachers and peers were out there. Like they were especially there to critique and judge me <laughs> and evaluate my performance. And there's nothing more nerve wracking than, than an audience that is there with the sole intention, but just to criticize you um, and be critical of you. And but what I, what I have learned is that if we can back up and realize that um, uh, there, was a, there was a famous uh, French uh, composer, um, Madame Boulanger, Boulanger, who would say, on est toujours devant l'absolu. Um, we are always before, before God. We're always before God, no matter where we go. Um, and if we realize, as I have, I do with my music to internalize it as first and foremost as worship, um, then we know we've, we have eliminated the fear of who's our audience. Our audience never changes. If God is our principal audience and what we are doing, we are doing to honor him, then we only have to do our very best in that moment. Um, it doesn't matter. What I've learned is it doesn't matter how many mistakes I make that I can count because I'm being critical of myself um, or how poorly I think I've sung or how I really thought I struggled to, um, to connect or to talk or speak or whatever it may be that I was trying to do. Um, if if we know our audience and we know that, that the Lord is our audience and we go out on that stage and that is our focus to do our best to honor the Lord, um, then you will suddenly feel that there is a pressure that is released because the fears that we have are, are tied to wanting to, to please um, the people that are there or to not be criticized by those people or judged harshly by those people. Um, but those, we'll let those, leave those people uh, to God. Um, 
and we go out and do our very best. So that's my encouragement to you, Amberly, is to, to just um, think about who your audience is um, and that we can narrow that audience to, to, to um, a predictable one. And that's, that is God who loves us and cares infinitely about us and will receive our brokenness uh, and, 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 and receive it um, as a sweet offering of praise to him. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be, uh, it just has to be of the most perfect intentions. And I think what you'll find, and, and I'll just, a little tiny anecdote. I, I recall these moments in through the years where I felt the worst about a performance, um, where I thought I had just done horribly and I just couldn't wait to get off the stage because I thought it was the, the most, the biggest failure in terms of the performance that I'd given, or maybe I didn't feel good that day myself. And I come off the stage and in the back of the room, there's some, um, an older woman one time that came up to me and with tears in her eyes and said, I just have to give you a big hug. She says, um, today, uh, she said, when I was a, a kid, my, my mother played the violin and every night before bed, she would play her violin for me. And there was a particular song that she would play for me every night. And that's the song that you played. And when you were playing it, I just closed my eyes. And what you gave me was another moment with my mother. And she said, I just want to thank you because, and, and just had to just with the tears turn and walk away because she couldn't get any further than that. Mm. And I thought, oh my gosh. And here I come off stage counting the, mis the, the mistakes that I'd made and counting the, the, the sharp and flat notes and the, these, all these, these things that don't matter. These don't have anything to do with, with, um, with music principally. Um, and they don't have certainly don't have anything to do with the purpose, the real purposes of music. Hmm. That's good. Kyle, we have um, one more question for you. This is from Miss Emily. Uh, she asked, disappointments are inevitable, especially if you're pursuing your dreams. And so when you face disappointment, how do you get past that? And how do you keep working towards your dream? Uh, well, yeah, it's true, uh, Emily, that uh, disappointments are, are definitely um, a part of the process. Uh, they are inevitable. Um, for me, um, I think I, just to be, to be completely honest, I struggle with the disappointments as much as, as you, maybe you yourself do since you're asking the question. Um, I just, uh, had a big, there was a big songwriting competition. Um, and I, in, I actually kind of entered it just, without any hopes or expectations, because I didn't want the disappointment, which is kind of weird. Uh, I know that you should, I, I've, it kind of goes contrary, but I'm not a big fan of competitions, I should also say, um, music competitions. I don't, but I, nonetheless, I entered it because there's, there's certain merit. If, if your song does emerge, it can give you some opportunities in the field. And I had, all of a sudden I got this email that said that my song had been selected in the semifinals and in the next two weeks, they would be announcing the finalists for the competition. And at that mom moment, I started having these serious expectations. I thought, well, oh my gosh, out of 26,000 submissions, I became a semi-finalist. And that's going to be, you know, equate to like around, you know, one to 2,000 songs that were that were selected as semifinals would be narrowed down to, you know, uh, you know, 10 songs to a category or something. And I just, I thought, oh, I have a chance, you know, <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, this already was something to celebrate and I was celebrating it, but quickly the celebration turned to anxiety and it turned to, you know, as the day approached when they were going to announce the finals, it was just so anticlimactical because, you know, an email came through and it was just like, ding. And I looked and it was, it was just that so quick. I mean, you can just see from the first line that I was not selected, you know, it's like, er thank everybody for, you know, the thank everybody for participating kind of thing. And it was like, and there was nobody there to, to grieve or celebrate or 
or frame it from the perspective of that moment with me. I was just, there I was alone with my disappointment and this little email and all those expectations and thinking, okay, if it's a finalist, then it might actually win. And then what could that mean? I might have an opportunity to meet somebody in the industry and have this golden chance to have an out, you know, you just start dreaming and, and the mind, you can't stop it sometimes. And, and it's all those expectations um, that, that, that create those disappointments. And man, I, I really struggled with that for, for a good part of a day. And then I, and then I went back to the, of all places to Facebook, to the, the, the post that I made about, about the excitement that I had about being a semifinalist and the, the achievement that that was. And I thought, you know, at every level, um, there's always going to be disappointment. You can get the grand prize and still be disappointed because it was the grand prize, but not enough people um, told you how wonderful it was, you know, or they didn't, they didn't actually pick up on the, the part of the song that you loved the most. They liked, they liked it be, for some other totally off the subject reason. And then you could be disappointed because they didn't appreciate the song the way you appreciated it. And um, so I, I think that first of all, disappointment is, is inevitable. It's a part of the process when you're pursuing your dreams. And I think it's okay to be disappointed because I think it's also okay for us to, to have those dreams. And we should, we shouldn't, and we shouldn't always go in like I initially did to that, that contest you know, saying, well, I'm probably not going to win this, so I'm not going to even think about it. Um, I think we should give ourselves a permission to dream and allow ourselves a vulnerability, which is, you know, if we don't achieve it, there's going to obviously be disappointment. But to reevaluate, and once again, coming back to Michael, you recapped the, the being graceful with ourselves, that um, did we evaluate on a new level? Did we try our best? Um, did, did we, what can we do and what can we do next? Because, um, well, the, the very next thought I had was, well, it's time to write another song, <laughs> you know, and Amberly, you coming back to you, um, it might be that way with your first song, you might write something and in the moment you become very excited about it and you might play it for somebody and they might ha not have the same response to it that you had, but maybe, maybe that song was for you. And sometimes I think that too, that I've written a song that I'm very excited about and maybe rightfully so, because maybe it was for me. That's good. Oh, Kyle, thank you. Incredible perspective. I, I knew this, I knew this interview would be good, but as always you over delivered and you made it great. Thank you just for your authenticity, being so personable, just being you, just being, being Kyle. And I mentioned it earlier in the beginning, but it is our goal that after listening to these stories and these interviews that, you know, we'll have a desire, you know, to continue to go to move forward and become the best version of ourselves that we can. So thank you for helping to make us better today. Kyle, we're definitely going to include in the show notes, you already mentioned Facebook and other places that we can find you. But those that want to learn more about Kyle Dillingham, where can we turn to any particular projects we can support? Yeah, uh, my website, kyledillingham.us. Um, you can uh, find links to all my social media, but it's essentially Instagram is at Kyle Dillingham. Uh, Facebook is Kyle Dillingham Music. Uh, I think the actual, I think it's at Kyle D-O-K-C or something like that. But, but you, I'm, I'm easy to find. Uh, um, so please do. I'm, I'm working on a brand new album right now, actually, that... Um, uh, there's not an exact release date, but, um, uh, I know reviewing kind of for this interview, one of the, th the thoughts that I had, it was, was thinking about some of my own goals and some of my own dreams. Cause you got me thinking, what are my current dreams? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I, I realized how important it is to continue dreaming even because we might accomplish some of those things and we need to, we need to repopulate that list. And I have a song that I wrote. It's the title track of, of my new upcoming album. It's called Homa. And, and yes, that's attached to uh, Oklahoma. <laughs> and it was my wife that was encouraging me to write a song about, about our state. She said, if anybody should be singing a song about Oklahoma, it should be you. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, that's interesting perspective. <laughs> and, um, 
so I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I, and I've been kind of developing a goal for that song. And I, um, and I, I'd like to, to see um, that song being played on every, at least country radio station in Oklahoma um, and giving, giving Oklahomans a chance to hear this song and to relate to it in the way that I, that I do. And I've, I've had some initial response. And maybe if there's time, and I don't know what the time limit of this podcast is, I can share it with your audience. Because it's not, ju- and it's not just for, for Oklahomans, but it's really a song for anybody who has a place that they call home and <clears throat> in hopes that we find that. And it's Oklahoma is the setting for the song, but it can be a home can be that it could be a person. It could be a, can be a place. It could be uh, somebody uh, in Afghanistan or somebody in Oklahoma. It doesn't matter where you are. We all got to find, find, a, find our home a place where there's security and, and all the, the warm uh, things that attach us to a place. Well, Kyle, how could we possibly turn down that opportunity? As you're getting set up, I'm going to set up our viewers and listeners for next week, and we'll have you close us out. So, Kyle, thanks again for being with us today. Uh, We always like to remind you about our upcoming Dreamer Endure interview. And next week, we're going to be bringing in a relatively new friend of LoveWorks, and his name is Clint Gresham. He's a best-selling author, international speaker, and he's also a 2010 Super Bowl winner with the Seattle Seahawks all decade team. Carolyn, I'm having a hard time knowing what these Roman numerals are. Would that be Super Bowl number 46? It's number 48. Oh, okay. I shut up, so <laughs> I am not an expert in Roman numerals. <laughs> Super Bowl champions number 48. I think we're somewhere in the 50s right now of Super Bowls, but anyhow, mark your calendars for that. It's going to be awesome. But Kyle, if you don't mind, uh, close us out with a special new song. Sure. And just as an encouragement to you, Michael, you 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 were embarrassed about the strings on the how many strings on a violin. Uh When I was in uh, when I was in junior high school uh, youth group, uh, the youth pastor had announced that the next Sunday we were going to be having a Super Bowl party for youth group. And I had to ask what sport it was. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, you win. No. <laughs> this is a little song called Homa. Fourteen days and nights away, I fiddle up and down this highway, singing almost every night, trying hard to make it right with every minute adding up. I drink this coffee in my cup, these little smiles reminding me why I can't wait to be back home I look so good from up above my home I place where I first fell in love oh I can't wait to be back home in Oklahoma stars up in the summer night sky home I sunsets always make me cry oh I can't wait be back home in Oklahoma. I roll over, you're not there, but I'm the only one who cares, cause everybody's smiling now. I find a way to give somehow, but the last thing that I want to see, one more stage between my lover and me, I've got to let you go. But tomorrow you should know I'll be back home. Look so good from up above my home, place where I first fell in love. Oh, I can't wait to be back home in Oklahoma. Stars up in the summer night sky, home. The sunsets always make me cry. Oh, I can't wait to be back home in Oklahoma. Oklahoma, 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 storm is rolling in, it feels so good to breathe again, the slanted sky reminding me why I'm so proud to be back home. June bugs in the front porch light my home. Everything will be all right. Oh, I can't wait.
to be back home. Green fields far as I can see in home. A little simple life is all I need. Oh, I can't wait to be back home in Oklahoma. Something in the atmosphere of Oklahoma. Well, I can tell the Lord is here and it feels so good. Be back home in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. That was awesome, Kyle. <laughs> Those of you that are listening, watching, you. say that you heard it here first on the Dreamers and Doers podcast, Kyle Dillingham's title track called Homa. I'm already imagining this playing on radios across stations across the state of Oklahoma. That was incredible, Kyle. Thanks for the treat. Thank you, my brother. Thank, well, we you. thank, you. thank you, too. Well, so thank you, to again, everybody, for tuning in today. You can check out all things LoveWorks at loveworksleadership.org. And also remember that real leaders, that they don't blend in, but they stand out. Dream big. And do your dream. See everybody.